it actually allows all of the building value and real property to fit under a 20 year life. They put in 15 million and they literally on their taxes show a negative $45 million tax loss. So there is an arbitrage play there where you can pay less. If they have a lot of other income, they've saved me, so I'm good. That's what's gonna bring you the most fulfillment. All right, Jason Harris, welcome to the show. Hey, glad to be here. Good Thank to have you. you on. So people that don't know you, haven't followed along, give us like a 30 second overview of you, your group, Harris Group. I know you guys do a lot in real estate, tax appreciation, all that kind of stuff, but give us a give us the 30 second thumbnail of what you guys do, who you guys are. Uh, yeah, um, essentially started my career in real estate in 2010, 2014, took it to outside investors, mostly multifamily value add space, buying existing building, ugly and old, fixing it up, making it better, uh, trying to increase net operating income, and then selling it two to three years later, hopefully for a nice profit. And then mm. either 1031 exchanging out to not pay taxes or in other structures, just taking the overall benefit and then reinvesting again. So done, I've done that since 2014 and about 2020, 2019, started our fund doing the same thing, but just in a bigger scale yeah. with a, more of a diversified approach instead of individual isolated deals each time. And so, uh, yeah, we have an awesome. 11 man team now and hiring a couple more right now. Yeah. And How much do you guys manage it. right now? About 150, 160 million. Okay, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. We're gonna dive into all this stuff. I, I wanna hear about, you guys do a lot of tax appreciation for your clients as well. It should be fun to talk about. Talk about real estate, we're gonna talk about the markets right now. It should be a should be a fun time. So let's actually, let's dive into first, why the transition to a fund? There's a lot of people that listen to this that are syndicators that do real estate. They've done onesie twosie projects that have done well actually. Why did you guys switch to a full out fund? I was very hesitant to go to a fund, actually. I, I liked doing the individual deal analysis mm -hmm. per deal and knowing what I was getting. And um, But in 2019, we were scaling and growing and there was some complications to just the overall admin operations to doing a syndication. There's plenty of that on the fund side as well. However, I, I met someone that had a background uh, working in private equity in Wall Street for 20 plus years who was more experienced in the fund model and did an analysis of syndication versus fund and how that it would best impact investors from tax shelter strategy, from investment returns. And although they're very similar, there was some benefit by doing a fund over the syndication yeah. in that most of our investor base is looking for diversification and mm -hmm. they don't want to have all so the So investors money. are on multiple properties, not just one at a time. Right, yeah. yeah, so five to seven core properties within a fund structure allows them to not have maybe too much allocated just to one. And so if it doesn't turn out as well, just like a mutual fund or anything else that you'd be buying in way of stocks yep. on the market. And so we started that and it allowed us to scale a little faster and I think than we had thought it could. And uh, it attracted more family office mm, money. Cool. And, and that, I think that helped to go that So yeah, way. was there so, friction from previous investors that didn't want the fund model? Actually quite a few. Um, and what, how'd you guys deal with that? Uh, it was it was a difficult conversation, and ironically, the economics were better for them. Mm. Um, when I was younger in my career or newer to it, though, they were willing to pay out higher amounts to me or company for more direct access, I think, to me. And I realized as we were scaling, mm. I, I didn't have the time to be as involved in every single deal. And so it made more sense where we had hired a team where we could have the team share in the time that mm. we are on the properties. And so that's what we ultimately were trying to get to is that I, I can't be as involved as, as I've been. And with that, as we're growing, you know, we're going to share in more economics to the investor. And so I actually was getting 50 cents on the dollar of any profit after they got their initial basis back. Oh, really? And so, so they get their basis, you were getting 50% after, oh, wow. I had people Jeez. investing a million yeah. dollar plus with me. They fronted all the money. I didn't put up a dollar mm. only because there was a relationship there of trust, right? Yeah, and I'd yeah. proven myself, I think. And I was a financial advisor, wealth and wealth management at the time too. And so yeah. there was several sit downs. And so there was, there was trust. Some of this is family and friends too, right? So yeah. they, they knew me uh, personally as well. But with that, they were fronting the money on most of the deals. And then we'd split everything 50, 50 on the upside after they, they got their initial uh, investment back with no preferred return. However, the returns were really good. And mm. so with that word spread and organically, we started to take on more and more 
friends and family of those yeah. who we worked with. And it got to a point where we had to scale in a different direction. So it was hard for them initially, a few of those conversations. And the biggest thing you said was less access to you. I think it that was. That was the biggest that you think objection to their brain. Like, oh man, if they moved to a fund, I'm just going to be a, a number on a spreadsheet. I'm not going to be Jason's yes. best friend that we're going to talk every deal through. Is that there, correct? Yes. There was more lunches and sit downs personally that we could go through and having that access. And I still try to make myself accessible, especially with those early relationships that helped mm. us get to where we are now. Um, but I think that was a concern. Am I going to be able to demand Jason's time when needed and wanting to? I almost would prefer to give up more economics in order to have access. And so yeah. we've tried to make that still possible. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, and it's funny. So we, we work with a lot of funds. We hear this a lot, right? Mm -hmm. the, the transition from syndication to fund, there's always some friction with some legacy old investors. But typically, and I, I hear kind of two tales. I'm curious what happened. Did most of those investors say, well, okay, fine, I'll come? Or do they actually leave and not invest again? There's two I can think of that didn't but everyone else did. Mm. Um, some did and it wasn't a big deal for them. A few did, but there was several conversations that were had first. Yep. Uh, some of the, big, the biggest concerns that I remember in the early stages of this was you don't have a track record specifically to a fund model. Mm. I trust your ability to d take one deal, but how are you gonna operate five, seven, 10 properties within one fund? Mm. And there's, uh, some different complications to doing that. And so I don't have anything to go and do due diligence on your ability or the team that you've uh, hired and some of them who've worked for yeah. you maybe only a year or Interesting. two. Interesting. And what was your response to that? Um, uh, well, I, I, I guess you just tell them, yeah, you're right. That is that is the case. But here's Matt Denning, my CIO's fund experience and what yeah. he's done in his track record and, and mine. And each deal still has its own individual pro forma that we put yep. together, just like we've done in the past. There's nothing new there. We're buying the same investments we've bought in the past. However, with uh, Matt's uh, risk management background and making sure that we have liquidity needs to get through the difficult parts of a value add process, forcing vacancies, you know, you're not gonna be bringing in as much rent income. You're gonna have some challenges which we faced during COVID, the pandemic, labor costs have gone up, supply chain timelines have been shot. And so with that, um, you know, keeping adequate reserves to get through the process so that we can achieve post renovation, yep. stabilization on the properties and get the higher rent rates that we're aiming for. That's a challenge. And we did have challenges. Fortunately, though, we did have adequate reserves and a plan. And now we have more of a track record with our fund models to showcase beyond just the syndications. It's, it was challenging. Yeah. And some of those. That's investors, pretty good. Only two that didn't, didn't yeah, come yeah. along. The rest came. Yeah. And I think, I mean, what you said is we're already kind of doing this. We already, and actually it's a lot of headache to manage eight syndications at once because there's a different cap table. There's different terms and investors. It's a lot easier actually eight properties in a fund because it's just everything rolls together. The accounting, the back ends, you could argue is actually yeah. a lot easier. Yes. So that's what we see typically after the fact. Now you mentioned though, after the fact, you've raised more money from different investors that like the fund model more. Is that correct? From big, bigger family offices and stuff like that? We're seeing bigger checks come now that we have a fund structure versus a syndication. Mm, yeah. and, and it's because uh, they're willing to allocate more of their portfolio to a fund, knowing it's further diversified within within the, the fund itself. And so I believe that you know the more fluent uh, family offices or multifamily offices, they'll write the checks that are bigger than just a high net worth ma and pa type investor would yep. feel comfortable with um, in just a isolated one-off deal. Because obviously that's a big representation of someone's net worth potentially if you're starting to get into that seven figure number. So, yeah, very interesting. Have yeah. you guys changed your approach uh, raising capital from syndicator, smaller investors to family offices? And what has been that change if there is one? Uh, we structured everything from the beginning that our end investor that we hope to eventually achieve is going to be an institutional investor. Yep. And so there's lots of processes in place that we're continually trying to improve in order to get a $25, $50 million plus type check. And that's Matt's background. That's why he wanted to design it that way. And yep. so while we work mostly with individual investors, that's the end goal to be... Um, to have those processes in place that we can eventually get those bigger checks. So with that, yes, there's been changes, but as far as the overall assets and how we're going about it, not a lot has changed other than the underwriting process with what the market currently is now versus what it was two or three years ago. I mean, yeah. obviously there's a lot of changes in, in that aspect of things. So, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. really cool. How'd you attract Matt? So Matt's your partner, came from Wall Street. So it's interesting that you know you guys decided to make the switch. You brought in an outside partner that had ran the fund model, which I think is a great idea. To give confidence to investors moving over there. What was that story? Have you you known Matt for a while? How'd you attract Matt to your firm? So yeah, in 2020, um, gosh, it feels like it was 2019, but it was 2020. We moved to Hawaii. I lived in Kauai for six, seven months. Oh no way! And my so walk us through that. Why my, why'd you move there? Yeah. Well, it was actually just because things were getting weird. I think, and mm. specifically our kids uh, in the school system, they were going to have to sit in boxes, wear masks, and it just mm. seemed like there was too much control. I had a buddy who owned a, a property in Kauai. He couldn't rent to anyone. It was a nightly rental, uh, but mm -hmm. he couldn't rent anymore. Hawaii shut it down. And mm -hmm. so you could only hire, you could only rent if someone was willing to sign a six month lease or longer. Interesting. And so he was hurting. We were friends. He came to me, we chatted, and mm -hmm. I said, I'll sign a six month lease. Yeah. I moved out there. We signed the six month lease, put our kids in a uh, charter school there. We mm, we knew cool. Kauai already loved it yeah. there. And so with that- um, Really interesting. That's awesome. That's interesting. Things yeah. were getting yeah. challenging. I mean, I was yeah. waking up at four in the morning, which is seven or eight o'clock mountain time. Yep. And then one o'clock comes around, which is a five o'clock here. And I just kept working. And my wife seeing the 12 hour plus days being put in every day, wasn't the lifestyle that she was expecting going to Hawaii, going to right? Hawaii, but things yeah. like slow down, right? <laughs> yeah. You chill and you yeah. enjoy the island. And, 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 and I understood that. And so I knew I needed to hire someone that was more my right-hand man. And mm -hmm. initially, Bridger, I was looking for someone that could be me, like who had my background. Yeah. I spent seven years in wealth management. I've always been a student to investments since I was a kid and started really early and young. And that helped me get to where I was now. And um, I also have spent a lot of time understanding taxes and I love tax strategy and trying to pay as little as possible legally with what's available to me in the tax code. And I've been very good at that myself and have yep. shared that with my investor base as a financial advisor and as a real estate investor. And mm -hmm. so it's hard to find that person that you know could be like you, but that's what I was looking for. Ironically, uh, we put out something to hire for that position as CIO essentially. Um, I met Matt as well as many others, and Matt did not have my background, but he had something I didn't have with the fund management, which mm -hmm. I knew we were yep. looking to do. Yep. And so after several interviews with him, I put him on a six month 1099 trial period mm -hmm. where he worked from Rhode Island, where he was working in New York at the time, and I was still in Hawaii. And I realized there was a lot of synergy. There's things he didn't know, but I could teach him and same he knew that could teach me. And it cool. was actually a lot better find than what I initially was looking for. And so I love, I love just to cut you off. Yeah. The six month period you did. Yeah. That's something that I have uh, been burned on a few times as a business owner is you just, you think someone's so great, you just hire them. Mm -hmm. Here's your salary, you're in, here's your bonus, whatever. And all of a sudden two months later, you're like this is not the guy what or the I gal thought. we thought, right? And I, I'm actually a big, I don't know, promoter now of dating your partners or dating people you're hiring is you put them on a trial period. Yeah. And uh, I love that concept. Is that the first time you'd done that or you'd done that prior with other partners? It was actually the first time I did it, but it was mm -hmm. a key position. Yeah. I mean, I knew that this was someone that was a long term. Even I think Matt will finish his career with Harris Investment Group. I, I mean, mm -hmm. he, 20 plus years that I think he'll work. And so definitely wanted to make sure it was the right fit. He was relocating his family, if it made sense. Like I really mm -hmm. wanted to know him well. I think I, we both wanted to see how we worked and what happens in high pressured situations and how mm -hmm. we handle it. And so yeah. that dating period was important. And I realized, okay, we have a great find here and, and it's been awesome. And I'm glad that we did have that six months. Yep. Since then, we've done that though with new hires and more. Mm, and yeah. so we actually have a plan or process to scale to a much higher salary base plus performance or bonus structure yep. after a year's time based on how things work. And so we, we try to do 1099 or some type of lower structure that can scale quickly mm, based on yep. performance and other aspects. So now that's cool. That's cool. awesome. So then uh, did you come back from Kauai? When did you come back? What what was the plan there? What happened? We, we did end up coming back. We did get a little island fever and just want to be back mm, to the mainland, family, yeah. friends and other aspects of things. Uh, but we've since bought two things there and I'm under mm. contract right now for something else. And so oh, we really? love so, yeah, the you island. Love back, yeah. um, we're actually going to do a podcast also. And I'm thinking about filming some of those there and just going back and forth. But yep. just love being there. And now yep. that our teams, uh, we've got some great team members. I have the ability to step away a little bit more and focus on some of those uh, goals that I have personally. And so, yep. yeah, that it's been great. That's cool. But didn't want to live there long term, at least... 
My wife yeah. would definitely live there she long would love term. It, yeah. I still love what I do and I'm passionate yeah. about what I do. And so I like getting breaks and I like getting away, but yeah. I still love being involved. It's, but I think in time, you know, mm. years years later, I, I may be Slow not working as much. Yeah. yeah, yeah, interesting. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, walk us through, you're very big on taxes. You were talking before how you help, you have a zero, is it a 0% zero club or zero dollar club, something like that? Cl- club zero, but club I call it zero percent club. But okay, yeah, club, club zero. zero. How does somebody get in the Club Zero when you're investors? What does that mean? Walk us through Club Zero. So, yeah. No, thanks for asking. In 2013, just to give context, I was still a financial advisor with Edward Jones. And um, a couple of families that I helped represent or work with, it was more the kids that I was uh, had the relationship with. But the parents were going through a transition of the state planning and tax strategy of how they're going to pass all their wealth to their kids, grandkids, and yeah. so on, creating a legacy. And I got to sit in on a lot of those meetings and I learned a lot of great things that the affluent do to protect their wealth, grow it, and make it tax sheltered. And this particular individual had sold a meaningful position in a real estate project, made about $20 million in capital gains from a, a real estate development he had, mm. and he didn't pay a dime in tax. Mm, cool. And I'm like, $20 million, not paying any taxes. Yeah, that's awesome. This is illegal. And this is shady. I mean, I really did. I was like, mm. I don't I don't feel comfortable. There's no way you can do that. Mm. And I think it was just reinforcing my knowledge and understanding of the tax code, of what's available for those who are active in real estate, mm. and how you can use phantom loss, bonus depreciation benefits to offset uh, either passive income or all sources of income. And this particular individual was able to do all sources. So that was considered a capital gains tax. Mm. And so he was able to use these built up depreciation losses from other real estate he owned to shelter the sale of this real estate project. And my mind was blown. I already loved real estate. I was doing it in a small scale compared to him, but I actually changed my strategy where like, if I can pay $0 in taxes and anything I earn is tax free, as long as I own enough real estate and can generate enough losses to offset my gains, active income sources, capital yeah, gains yep. and, and, and the like, that's a great wealth strategy yep. because our biggest tax in America is taxes. Yep. And so for me, it was a game changer. And 2014, it's when I realized I need to raise money beyond my own because I make a decent income, but not a lot. And it's taken me a long time to save up for each deal. Mm -hmm. So I started to reach out family and friends and doing JV partnerships and then later syndications. And as my income increased and my portfolio increased, I wasn't paying taxes and I was using the same strategy that some of these families were. And so I think I just dug my heels further into understanding tax shelter benefits because one, it benefited me, but it also was of great value to my investor base. And so it was a yeah. huge win-win and worth my time. And when the Tax Cut and Jobs Act came out in 2017, 2018, huge benefits were available, far better than they were even before then, mm, that yeah. allowed us to then grow even even bigger. And so uh, awesome. we yeah. focused what kind of assets we bought within real estate that could help generate those meaningful losses mm-hmm. and then help maybe someone who's selling a company and they're coming into a big liquidity event yep. or an exit and they're gonna make 50, 100 million plus. They don't wanna pay a third or more to the government of that money they worked hard for. And so we found ways to structure our fund and our syndications to generate meaningful losses. And in some cases, use those losses against the sale of the company or or other amounts. And so that's how it happened. That's cool. There's funny enough, uh, six months ago, so I run a fund right now, a hedge fund. We had an investor we're pitching on this, our whole strategy and stuff. And it was so funny, he just full stops us middle of the pitch. He goes, guys, I do not care how much money you're gonna make me. I make plenty of money. I got too much money. How? can I use this strategy to save on taxes? Yeah, absolutely. And we were sitting there and there's like, we do a crypto hedge fund. And so it was like, there isn't a ton. You know, mm-hmm. we were like, ah, there's not a lot. And he said, he's like, guys, honestly, this year I have way too much money. I know you're going to make me a great return and stuff and it's going to be fine. I only carry, care about <laughs> tax loss. And it was funny, you know, from our fund perspective, we didn't have a lot to offer him. But as from a real estate or a gas, oil and gas or whatever fund structure you're doing, or even maybe parlaying a crypto hedge fund with a a piece yeah. of a tax shelter is a massive benefit when pitching, you know, people with real money, not kind of onesie twosie sure. investor, people that have yeah. actual real money is a massive play and something that I wish we had already structured in our fund. So um, give us a, if you can, give us an example or two of, you know, an investor that comes with you with a certain dollar amount. Give us an example of how you guys help that investor shelter with taxes. Awesome. Um, yeah. Real quick though, too, on that, if I may. Yeah. 
crypto, depending on what stage you were in and when you were in it and how that was going, it, it's so funny. I've done a lot of presentations on real estate, but I've sometimes followed the crypto or NFT guys. And it's like the returns that crypto and NFT can provide versus real estate is nowhere near as sexy, especially when things are good, right? Yeah. When crypto is good, it's really good. And so it's, it's kind of funny. At, at certain times, you probably could say, just give the 30 million away and we'll make that in a few weeks or yeah, a few months yeah. and, and then that's it won't matter, we, right? And that's so, kind of like, what we said. And then we also said you can tax loss harvest, right? Yeah. If, you're, if you have right. existing crypto or whatever, yeah. you can sell and then buy back in or whatever. Yes. Uh, that was all we could offer yeah. really, but which is fine. But. but there is something about keeping that money yep. and not giving so, so much. It hurts, yeah. it hurts to write that to check. Yep. And so with, with us and what I saw this gentleman do and what I then helped other investors do and in time was doing myself, um, I realize there's a way that we can we can help certain people who have the active professional status to use real estate as a massive tax shelter loss so they don't have to end up paying those taxes mm -hmm. as long as they're willing to do the right criteria to meet the active professional status. And so in those circumstances, I can give an example. We helped uh, in, uh, in one particular time someone that sold uh, actually a different time that was a meaningful amount, about 60 million mm -hmm. that they uh, had in way of equity uh, and a capital gains event on. And some of that was actually W-2 earned income. Mm, so yeah. that's tax at ordinary income rates versus the capital gains, which is long-term capital gains, not, not quite as high of a tax rate. But in looking at the analysis, we were able to take a piece of that 60 million and create a uh, diversified portfolio of truck stops mm. with some value add multifamily and generate a 2.33 or 2.4 to equity ratio of depreciation. So what that means wow. is yeah. take $20 million, let's say, and invest it across those truck stops and uh, some multifamily. Mm. In that year, you can do something what's called a cost segregation study to find out how much of the gas station truck stops uh, how much benef uh, depreciation, depreciation loss you can you achieve. From it. Yeah. Usually you can't depreciate land. It doesn't go down in value. But anything that's considered real property or building value has a building lifespan. Because depreciate. They have a lifespan. Yeah. They're going to have to replace them sometimes so you can depreciate those assets. Correct. And so loss. as you know, car uh, carpet and uh, countertops aren't going to last as long as the building structure itself. And so the IRS typically puts it in 5, 7, 15, and 27 and a half year buckets or 39 if it's commercial. Well, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act allows anything that's a 20 year life item or less to all be sheltered in the first year. Mm. And because truck stops and gas stations fit in a unique part of the tax code, if 50% of the revenue comes from the oil and gas from the pump mm. and not from the convenience store, it actually allows all of the building value and real property to fit under a 20 year life. Wow. Okay. And so what we did is we bought, let's say $50 million worth of gas stations, mm -hmm. back out land where we were buying the truck stops. It only assessed about 5% of it mm -hmm. to the land value. Usually it's more like 20 when we're running our model to be safe, yep. but 15 to 10% is pretty common. Okay. In this case, it was five or six. $50 million property. So 10, let's call it 5%. Five, 5%. Call, it, call it 3 million was assessed to okay. land. $47 million was then assessed to the building value yeah. or real property. Now, when you buy these truck stops, of course, Bridger, we could go and pay cash for them. But more often than not, we're going to go ahead and get financing, yeah, yep. let the banks put up 65 to 70% of their money, and we'll put up the rest 30, mm. 35. Yep. And so what happens is you get the same amount of depreciation loss benefit, whether you're an all cash buyer yeah. or whether you're using leverage. And so for a person like this, who's looking for tax shelter as one of their primary needs, they can put up say 30% of a $50 million purchase, $15 million, and it generate a $47 million loss. Wow. In this case, Jeez. that would be a three to one ratio. So it wasn't quite yeah. that good. It was more like so uh, they put 2. in 2.4. They put in 15 million and they literally on their taxes show a negative $45 million tax loss. Just and, unreal. And, and imagine if that $47 million loss can shelter earned income, capital mm, gains, yeah. or any income. You're talking about 35 to 40% on the dollar. So Jeez. 40 cents on 47 million. You're looking at $18.8 .8 million of potential tax savings, depending on the tax bracket you're in. Yep. Put up 15, get 18 million back. We have had situations in helping some groups get more money back in tax savings than they actually invested in equity. Mm. 
It's incredible. That's so interesting. And now wow. you're risk free essentially yeah. from the investment before the investment itself actually even performed. So, well, a couple things to unpack there. Yeah. No. Yeah. Number yeah. one is the investors like, man, it's risk. I'm I'm I'm, I'm almost back to my basis now. You've saved me 15, if they're really, if they have a lot of other income, they've saved me. So I'm good. Even if Very we meaningful. break yeah. even on this property, this is the, a great deal. Um, number two, you're probably not going to break even. You're probably going to make some money on this property. That's right? what we hope to do. Like, <laughs> that's the real do, right? reason we're in the business <laughs> yeah. is to make, yeah, to make some or have cash flow from the business, right? That you're going to offset. Um, now, third question, when you sell the property, do you have to recoup those things that you wrote off and stuff? Do you have then a bigger tax bill later? Great question. Yeah. So Let's let me in. There's it's a little more complicated than it may seem as far as the answer goes. But let's say, yes, you recoup the depreciation loss. Okay. However, it's capped at 25 percent or less on the recapture. So get a benefit today at 40 percent if you're in the highest tax rate. When you recapture later, you recapture it at 25 percent tax rate. So there is an arbitrage play there where you can pay yeah. less. Now, in addition to that, where it's also meaningful, and this gets missed more times than not, unless you're a sophisticated investor, family office, or working with an asset manager, perhaps. Yeah. What also is a benefit, Bridger, we were talking about this uh, cost segregation study, right? That put everything in a lifespan, five, seven, 15 years. If we buy this property, sell it five years later, how much are those five-year items worth five years later? Zero. We've we've essentially yeah. said it's a we've zero value. Said it's zero. Yeah. You recapture all of those five year items at a zero dollar value. Mm. So not but they're only, still there. Yeah, they're still yeah, physically exactly. There. Yes. Not only yeah. is the tax rate lower from forty to twenty five in this example, but you're also recapturing at a lesser value. Yeah. And so there is strategy to pay less in taxes, even if you sell outside of some kind of mechanism like a ten thirty one exchange. Yeah. But I will say more often than not, someone whose primary goal initially is the tax savings, we're structuring. Things things in a way where we'll use the truck stop gas station first as a massive tax shelter play. Mm -hmm. And then maybe in a couple years after you establish long-term intent, then we sell the asset in a 1031 where we can then uh, reposition the equity into higher performing assets like our value add multifamily space. And there, now it's about returns. So 1031, you can sell property, you can move it into another property in a certain time period without paying taxes on the transaction. Exactly. It's really nice. You can just parlay essentially one one deal into a bigger deal, bigger and bigger and bigger, and, and then just take the cash flow from those deals. Right, exactly. And and most of the time these investors are looking to indefinitely defer that taxable gains because in America at least, and I think there's other countries that do this as well, there's a step up basis at death. And so mm. all those depreciation losses and capital gains that would have otherwise been taxable in your lifetime, they all get erased and there's a step up in basis to the value of the portfolio mm. at death. And so yeah. the idea is to make it indefinite. And then along the way, you take cash flow or pull equity out in the form of cash out refinance loans. Loan proceeds are not yeah. taxable. And so we can still access money from the assets and grow the money over time, doing it tax efficiently. And that's that's usually the goal. Yeah. So, so I will make mention of this though. The basis does carry forward to the new asset. And so that $47 million benefit, if we sell the $50 million portfolio, hopefully at a profit, right? Mm. That's the whole, yep. we're, we're incentivized to drive IRR. That's what yeah. we do. Yeah. So we're selling hopefully at a higher amount and then we take that equity, reposition it into multifamily to grow it at a higher IRR opportunity. Yeah. And But the basis that we took initially on those first properties purchased does move forward into the new properties. Yeah. Uh, making it where you don't have as much depreciation loss opportunity as you could on the new new portfolio that you would have had you brought in fresh cash to buy that new portfolio because mm, there's a gotcha. basis carry forward. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Now, is, is do you do all this in your fund or do you, if you're going to advise somebody, again, not financial advice people listening, but would you have them go to a, maybe one of your syndications or a different fund that's oil and gas first and then come into one of your multifamily funds? Or do you have a full product that does all this in one? Yeah, yeah thanks for asking. Uh, the funds that we've done in the past, we do incorporate some truck stop gas stations, even if it's primarily a multifamily fund. Mm. We'll usually have a thirty up to a 30% niche investment where we could do land development, truck stops, and some others that we think are complementary to the multifamily. But certain circumstances, especially the one I'm mentioning, where someone's coming into a meaningful amount and they may approach us with a $20 million plus type of amount, we can, if we're not in a 
fund raise where we're fiduciaries to those investors. We can do something tailored and customized to them. And, and that's what we've often done where someone will come and say, I want X amount of dollars and this is how we want to strategize it. And yeah. then we'll overweight to truck stops, gas stations that have the bigger benefits and then create a strategy to over time yep. reposition the equity into more of a higher IRR opportunity like multifamily is. Yeah, so, really cool. I yeah. love it. What a what an interesting, unique, I love uh, yeah, that strategy. Yeah, I don't know a lot of people who have done that. It's Do truck stops get bid up or they, do you pay a premium because people know this strategy with specifically you, two truck stops? You know, it's operators who are in the truck stop business or gas mm. stations who know about it. And they're using the same benefit that we would be using it for. Yeah. They're active though in the operations and that's where they make their revenue. Yeah. So you and I have our companies that we can drive income and revenue from, yeah. but their business is the actual operations. And so yeah. more times than not, unlike our multifamily where we're the on-site operators trying to drive value, on the truck stops, gas stations, we're hiring good operators out there. And yeah. usually the best operators achieve better financing, which is important to us. So we're yeah. going to buy the asset, hiring an operator to run it effectively because we want a good operator to achieve uh, a good EBITDA or EBITDA yeah. to allow them to afford to pay us the lease uh, rate that we've negotiated. And so usually you do a 15 or 20 plus year uh, lease agreement with the operator. Mm. And we want to make sure that they're incentivized making good profit above the lease. But we have annual escalators built into that. So there's not as much operational burden on us on the truck stops. But we're usually, you know, two to three years only in that position before trying to sell it at a profit. So yeah. there's a cap rate spread. We're still trying to buy six, seven. It was different a couple, a few years ago. Yeah. Seven and a half cap rates are higher, yeah. but then selling them for, you know, 1% cap rate less, yeah, cool. making money on the equity side on the spread yeah. plus the annual escalator. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Wow. Really cool. I love yeah, that strategy. Very, That's yeah. Very, very unique. Very unique. Um, I love it. Now switching gears, you've been in the, this game a while you've been watching markets for a while. What are your thoughts on the current banking crisis that's going on? Are we through the weeds yet? Are we, are, do you think more banks are collapsing soon? And what's kind of the opportunities that you see uh, come out of this? None of us know, right, Bridger? I think yeah. we all have our our hopes and our guesses of what's gonna happen. Uh, purely opinion. No, I don't think that we're out of it. Obviously, President Biden came out. There, um, the FEC, what am I saying? The FDIC. Federal Reserve. Oh, yeah. The Fed's come out and taken their stance that they're going to back a lot of these regional banks. Yeah. But um, I think that there's going to be some more pain still until rates come back down further. I think a lot of people who have seen the unattractive yield that savings and money markets had took a portion of their business and we were willing to risk it in government bonds. Yep. And as we see bonds drop, as yields rise as fast as they did, especially short-term duration, yep. they're sitting in a very vulnerable spot. And you know, when you have these bank runs of people- I think SVB, right? They had, it was about a two and a half billion dollar loss on bonds that they had bought about a year and a half ago. Unbelievable. And they marked down 40%. And I, I looked at a chart yesterday, there was, there's $675 billion. If all the banks appropriately marked what their value is today, it'd be a $675 billion loss. Silicon Valley Bank was like a, a billion to $2 billion loss. $675 billion total across all banks. It's pretty interesting. We can't in our financial system allow that to happen. We say that we're a capitalist society, but yet we saw what happened in 08. The, the Fed came to the rescue, the government came to the rescue and bailed out a lot of these banks that would have gone under. Yeah. But the catastrophic event that that would have caused is worse than, than letting them go under. And so yeah. oftentimes we see that they don't. And so it's my opinion that things will sort itself out and they're not gonna let too many of these banks fail, especially mm -hmm. the largest. Yep. Um, I've actually been investing in a lot of regional banks recently yeah. because of that. Been a good trade, yeah. And it, it's been, first <laughs> yeah. regional was great for me on Monday yep. and Tuesday. Yep. Actually this morning it was, uh, Credit Su Credit Suisse, I yep. think that I I did and got in and out, but not not that I do that a lot. I but bought, I bought three thousand shares this morning. Of Credit did you Suisse. really? Yep. Okay, yep. we'll see how it plays out. Yeah, yeah. we'll see. It's uh, it was cheap. It was like two dollars yeah. a share. I was yeah. like, I, I, it might go to zero, but there's a chance it doesn't. I don't I, know. I was in and out dollar ninety, sold it at two twenty, and then oh, now, I'm, oh, now cool. I'm back at First Republic Bank doing the same oh, thing you, because oh, cool. there's yeah. no news coming out. And anyhow. I don't believe in investing in them in the long term at the moment. I just think there's a lot of volatility and opportunity yep. because 
lot of fear and yep. fear drives uncertainty and the markets don't like uncertainty. Yep. I don't think that a lot of regional banks are going to go under. I think that there will be some security and I think the Fed's going to start taking more of a dovish approach to raising rates further because they see the impact it's having yep. and we'll kind of know where the inflation numbers are coming in. But as it relates to us, multifamily investors primarily, this is actually a, a positive opportunity. Now, there's definitely some negatives and there's mm -hmm. tailwinds because our investors can be impacted. In fact, we've yep. had some recently who uh, have been impacted by a lot of this mm -hmm. uh, recently and it's, yep. it's, it's really unfortunate. Yep. But um, what this does happen is when rates go up, less people can afford to buy a home. And when less people for, can, can buy or want to buy, they rent. Yep. And when there's a demand for more rentals, that usually drives higher rental rates. Yep. We're in the business of affordable housing, already catering to the lower end of the market mm. rent range. Yep. And so as we invest in the assets themselves and then put them back on the market, we're still like middle of the range of the rent range, but there's so much demand. Mm. So in the markets we're in, we're actually achieving far higher rental rates than what we thought we would achieve. And so yeah. even though cap rates have had some expansion going a little higher, We've seen 300 to 350 bips move in interest mm. rates and only 25 to 50 on the cap rates. And because of the rental rates that we're achieving post yeah. renovation, we're still sitting really good. And so I actually feel very fortunate, even in a market cycle that we're in right now, we're still seeing positive returns when most asset classes are either in bearish territory yeah, or just seeing a lot of losses. Yeah. And so, it, yeah, I, I, I mean, don't. Multi, multifamily has the best sharp ratio of all asset classes. It was the best in 2008. Yep. And, and again, it's same, same yep. similar, different because credit was totally taken away yep. at that point. But there was still 90% employed when you hit 10% unemployment mm -hmm. and most of them were renting. And so you change out some of the tenant base who can't afford, maybe who have been hurt with those who still have jobs and can. And that's why affordable housing, multifamily is, is a lot less risky than maybe some other real estate asset types. Yeah. And that's where we like to have the bulk of our uh, real estate assets is in the multifamily there. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting. Do you think over the next, and now we're talking about current crisis, but the next decade, um, it seems like trends are people, millennials, Gen Zs are not buying as many homes. They are choosing to rent, whether it's low end or high end. And it seems like they're pushing rental rates up and there's less supply and inventory of these rates. It almost seems like a, just a straight up trajectory for multifamily as far as rental rates go, which would, which pushes cap rates, which pushes everything else for the next decade. Do you see any blips in that uh, assessment that I've seen from a lot of reports? What are your thoughts on the next decade of no, multifamily? No, I think my sentiment's the same. In fact, I read a report yesterday, over 3 million uh, individuals or households eclipse one hundred fifty thousand dollars or more of annual income mm. and rent and choose to rent oh wow one hundred fifty thousand dollars or more of annual income you would yeah. think someone of that type of income yeah. can afford to buy yeah but they're not mm. three million in us and so i find that very fascinating that m there's an increased percentage of those who are not looking at buying a home as the American dream anymore mm, of what's yeah. going to help them have wealth or protection and safety in their retirement years. And so uh, you have talking heads like Grant Cardone who says, no, never, never buy a don't home. Buy a house, so yeah. it's very, it's very interesting. I don't share that um, feelings, but I benefit from it as there's a growing a trend. You get more and customers. Yeah. I they do. come and they yeah. rent your places out, right? It's very helpful. Yeah. And, and I, I have things I've done in my history that's made a home a significant and very meaningful asset for me yeah. and uh, even have made great money in, in buying homes. And so it's for me, interesting. it's different. I just looked at a report, uh, the average baby boomer. So most bought homes and so most of their wealth is rented there through, through owning a uh -huh. home. Average baby boomer, average net worth is $1.2 million right now. The is that average right? baby boomer. I was, I was blown away. I went and Googled it like three times. I was like, this can't be this true. Can't the be. average, because you think about like the average income earner in America is like, it's like 65,000 or yeah, something, 70,000, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is right pretty there. low right. in my opinion. And for the average, for the dead center of the, and I was like, but the average baby boomer has a net worth of 1.3, or one, it was 1.2 to 1.3 yeah. million dollar net worth. And most of it was driven by home ownership because the they just bought yeah, it. They, was, they were, and right now people are not making that same choice currently to buy homes and it's it's kind of interesting we'll see what happens to this generation very fascinating yeah. there's been a lot of run up in home values mm -hmm. where maybe there would be someone who's sat on their home 20 plus years yeah. where they would have a good amount of equity and 
That is very staggering, though. I, yeah. I actually am surprised. I know that there's more millionaires in America than there ever has been until yeah. recently, the last maybe nine months to a year. Yeah, maybe people dropped out of that. Right, right. Uh, because of maybe home values or the market. 401ks have, have seen a hit, too. But it is interesting um, that the largest portion of that is the home value, which doesn't actually translate to income and retirement. So there's yeah. still this crisis where people aren't, they don't have enough wealth yeah, to, retire, to, to yeah. live yeah, the retirement that they hoped for. Because so, what are you going to do? Sell your house and then downsize. rent. Yeah, then yeah, rent. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? yeah, yeah, exactly. Or downsize, I guess. You could pull equity out and downsize. But but you can't do that as much anymore. That used to be a big thing. California moved to Utah or yeah. Idaho or somewhere where it's much more affordable. Up. Yeah, exactly. Unless you're going to go to a townhome or something or a condo. But Going back to Matt, he sold his house in Rhode Island, great area, $1.2 million home. And at that time and in that area was actually a really nice home. Half acre, acre, mm -hmm. had a swimming pool, really nice big house. This is Rhode Island. This is Rhode Island. Yes. So he's like, okay, great. East Coast value coming out to the West. I'm going to be able to get this man big. mansion. Yeah. He could not believe. And it was during the boom in, in yeah. 2021, 2020, I think when he bought the house, because he was working abroad before he moved out here with yeah. his family. And it didn't translate as well as he thought. And so the, the whole downsizing and trying yeah. to move to a more affordable market isn't as easy mm -hmm. as it once was because housing's been strong and rental rates is, as well. And so it makes it harder to find yield yep. in, in this market. So it's interesting too playing out the next decade. I've thought about this. I obviously I talk about funds. I preach funds like this is all we do. I, I wonder if we're going to hit a point. I was, last year, I think it was one in uh, two years ago, it was one in seven residential homes were bought by Wall Street or big Wall Street funds, essentially. I believe last year was one in five um, yeah. of homes. Yeah. They're just continuing this scoop up of assets. And you, the World Economic Forum has put out that by 2030, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy, right, is their thing. And I actually, we are we are trending towards that where um, big funds, institutions, people like you and me are buying yeah. up all of the real estate. All of these small businesses are all selling to private equity or all selling to a firm or whatever. And uh, I wonder if we're going to trend to a point where if maybe everyone rents but to get the income, you would invest into a real estate fund while you're renting the properties that they buy. And that's how you generate cash flow back so to yourself because everyone's priced out. There's no way you could go buy a single family house. Maybe this is 2030 or 2040, mm -hmm. but you could invest into a REIT or a fund that would generate the cash flow that you would have, that you're paying in rent. So I just, I've thought about this game. Any thoughts? Just we're kind of going to the crazy zone for the next 20 years, but. I don't know if I have as, a lot of insight into it. I find it fascinating and I see it being plausible. Honestly, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that is the direction of where trends are going. And you're seeing more and more of these mini home concepts. Yeah. You're seeing people who are sharing homes, more and more families that are willing to live together to, in order to afford uh, sharing in the cost of a home. And so, yeah, it's it's changing a lot of how we view mm -hmm. home ownership in America. And uh, because of the inaffordability that's there, yep not just because values increased, but now looking at uh, debt and interest yep. expense being where it's at, it's pricing so many out. And then you've got these big institutions who have an obligation to achieve a certain return objective for the investor, mm -hmm. having cash and liquidity and needing to put it to work and scooping up uh, these prices because they pay cash, the interest doesn't bother them, and they know rental rates are continuing to grow. And so yeah. it very well can lead to that. Yeah, I, that's it's interesting. It. Now, the other side of the argument is you have a lot of deflationary aspects in real estate right now. You have these new types of construction, like the 3D printing construction. You've seen those, right? Yes. Where they go, that's very interesting. You also have remote workers. So you don't need to live in downtown LA. You can live in suburban or rural Kansas in a field, you know, with a tiny home and maybe that's the next generation of, you have a deflationary pull and we're not hitting it well, but maybe in the next 10 years, we do see a deflationary pull where this cheap land that's out in the middle of the boonies, all of a sudden, you could have a whole little city of tiny homes with maybe drones that bring in your groceries or something. Oh, I don't know, right? Yeah. Um, you could see this deflationary aspect happening as well. So maybe that, that'll be the saving grace for some people. This, if they still want to be able to buy affordable homes, they could on maybe cheap land that hasn't been utilized as well. But at least currently, it seems like the trend is trending towards less home ownership and more rents. I couldn't believe how many people in 2020 and 21 
that I met that didn't that worked in a different state than they were living mm, yeah. during COVID and the pandemic when everyone had to work from home. It was unbelievable how people migrated and and went somewhere else because they could mm, yeah. and were able to get California salaries and live in the Midwest yeah, and somewhere which yeah. was a lot cheaper. And so I think you're right in the aspect of if there's more and more remote jobs, there's opportunities to get you know higher salaries in markets that you know you don't have to pay as much and be able to benefit in that way but that changes everything from the housing uh logistics and what how that would play out and Mm. it's funny that you mentioned something that i remember my son came home and he's 12 and he's got all these big ideas but he he mentioned something about dad uh they're talking about by 2030 that i'll be able to just hop on a plane and orbit the earth and mm. you know 2025 there's this big push to, to if you have two hundred fifty thousand dollars, you can be the first one to orbit the earth yeah yeah uh just casually as yep. a as a fun thing to do and it's yep. just unbelievable in the future what that could mean as ai continues to expand yep. and drones bringing everything to I've us. Already, and... I've already pegged my ticket to go do it. Am I... Is that right? Okay. Well, no, I haven't, but I'm, okay. I'm like <laughs> saving money. I'm like, I, I will do that in my lifetime. And my wife is like the exact opposite, dude. Doesn't she want to... hates, she won't even watch a space movie. She like hates space. Like, I'm like, there's oh, all no. these like, like sci, like love sci-fi movies yeah. and stuff. She's like, won't even watch because the she's just scared of dying in space or suffocating or whatever, which is a, a legitimate fear, I guess. But yeah. I'm like, come on, like of all oh. the humans that have lived in history, have all dreamed about going up to space somehow. And we have the chance, we can pay a little bit of money and go. Like, you're not gonna take the chance. Like, what about our, what will our ancestors say about us, you know? Oh, <laughs> and, uh, she's like, no chance, dog. Like, she's like, I'm good right here. It's just funny, yo. So we'll see in a couple of years if that turns into a big argument. If, my, uh, my if I'm wife, trying to go to space or not. <laughs> we, we took our team recently to the Eastern Caribbean mm. out of Florida and actually went and visited the NASA. Oh yeah, uh, I've been there too, yeah. Center, cool. it was incredible. And they talked about how there's gonna be more and more of these trips starting in 2025. but. Carrie and I, my wife, we were talking more about that. And she's like, let me just give it five or six years, make sure everything's safe it's and they work out yeah. all the kinks. And, yep. and then let's talk about going. So maybe you'll have to negotiate by this day, we're going to, and, and, yep. and it may be more affordable, right? Yep. It may be something that by 2035, it's $5,000 a ticket. Yep. You know, it's just you unbelievable there, how yeah, technology. Can, yep. I, yeah. I, we'll see if we get there. It's kind of cool, this convergence technology of, of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Do you think, uh, you know, it's it's kind of interesting that NASA has spent, we went to the moon five times and then we don't go back and people like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson have spent billions of dollars yeah. getting technology to go to space. And they are, I mean, they've done okay, but struggled mm -hmm. for years. And these are the smartest entrepreneurs on planet earth. Yeah, It's, I don't know, it's, it makes me curious if we actually ever went to the moon. Are your, what are your thoughts? Did we land on the moon? Oh, geez. I don't know about that. I've uh, Yeah, there's been speculation on whether that's all true. And um, Come on, Jason. I give us say, your hot take. I, Did I, we land on the moon or not? What I, happened? I, I know so little in that regard. It wouldn't even be worth me commenting. I think that we did. Mm -hmm. Who knows? I, who knows? Yeah. I will say NASA is excited about the rockets that they're launching and taking to the moon again. Mm -hmm. And so... They make it sound like we've done it before and yeah. we're going to do it again. And uh, having obviously technology is uh, significantly better than it was during the 60s when, yep. when there was the big push. But, um, geez, I don't know. I, yeah, I would say so, probably. I don't know. I was a, I was like a full, like, yeah, we land on the moon. And then the last couple of years, I'm just... We're skeptic about it I all. Just get, I just get more and more skeptic because I see these amazing entrepreneurs, people... Jeff Bezos, yeah. like Elon Musk. And the Musk, amounts of money And the amounts of money it. and the years. They've been doing this since 2004, to 2023 and we still really haven't got to deep orbit. I mean, they are in low level orbits right now. And I'm like, man, in 1964, we were way behind the Russians. We had the space and all of a sudden we land on yeah. the moon and we've been there five times. Anyways, it's just, I love I, I love the speculation. We'll see if uh, they can prove it. I guess there's supposed to be five lunar rover or four lunar rovers that are on the, on the moon, but nobody can see them with telescopes. They left them there. They didn't bring them back, but no one can find them. So I don't know. I'm turning into more of a more every, skeptic As now. days go yeah. on, I become more and more skeptical of the moon landing. And it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't affect my life at all. I just think it's fun to think about. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I get more and more skeptical. So You know, they said the record for the golf ball hit 800 yards. 
And you would mm. think that if uh, guys can hit it three to 400 at the moon, it would travel a lot further than that. But I think you're right. There's reason to be skeptic. And I think the more and more as we see- the Or last... maybe they went once. I don't know if they went all five times, right? Yeah. Maybe they went twice. Maybe they faked one or two of them. I don't know. Yeah. They're Anyways, telling the weird. stories and they're driving revenue. So there may be a conflict of interest, but who knows? <laughs> yeah. We'll see if well, we go there again soon. But yeah, but, I mean, yeah. if by 2030, it'd be, I, I'll, I'll hop on a ship if, unless I, my wife's going to divorce me or something, but uh, she's yeah, mad at right. me yeah. if I'm leaving. Um, do you think, sorry, totally shifting gears. Um, with the current, you mentioned, we mentioned talk about 2008, kind of bail ending banks and now doing it again. Do you think this dis, this incentivizes banks going forward to make risky bets and say, well, if we, if they go bad, if they go good, we'll make tons of money. If they go bad, well, we'll just get sold or FDIC is going to step in. Do you think this, I mean, this is the second major time that they are moving in to save an industry, the banking industry, after making risky bets and mismanaging their book. And um, do you think this sets a bad precedent for the banking industry going forward? It does. It's it's been bad since 2008 when they were bailed out that time too, Mm -hmm. right? It's scary to think that we really don't have a free market capital society that we believe that we have Mm -hmm. because they have to let a few banks fail to be the... Uh, example mm. and and then one can see that if they don't come to the rescue then what happens mm. and that picture is just so much scarier yeah. than them coming through but you're right it does set a precedence um and to, to be fair i actually am happy they came in and saved svb at least the depositors because you had all yeah. these startups there you had a, like, a lot that would hurt the United States for years. A lot of people here. yeah. And maybe I, yeah. President Biden mentioned, he's like, we're only going to protect depositors. We're not going to protect the bank and the assets there. They are going to true capitalism way. And maybe they can find a good balance of saving depositors versus the bank itself. But sorry, I cut you off. But e- even then, Bridger, you're right, though. I like the approach. I, some of it seems like good marketing. If you really understand it, though, it is taxpayers that are still hurt by this all because Unlike in 2008, where they're saying that no taxpayers are going to be hurt by this, all they have to do is print more money. And it, when they print more money, inflation goes up, and inflation going up hurts our uh, the value hidden, of the dollar. So, so it's like yeah. it's still uh, it's still so us that get a- gets hurt by. Apparently, it. the TARPS program in 2008 apparently, so I've been told, actually returned a positive return to taxpayers, about a 20 percent positive return mm. to taxpayers, which I didn't know that. Mm. But again, this time they're saying the same thing: it's not going to hurt the taxpayer, or whatever. But it's still it still smells and tastes like quantitative easing. Yeah. And maybe yeah. it is, maybe it isn't. I guess we could dive in the numbers more, but that's what they're trying to preach. And I, I learned that about the TARPS program. Apparently it wasn't, but it's still, I think it was. I don't know. I got to yeah. do more research, I guess. I didn't have any thoughts on that. But. It, it, it is just overall, I think, if banks know that they can be rescued and will be rescued, they just have to be down the line they can't be as risky as other banks. And I think that's mm. where it gets to be scary, where they'll let a few fail to set the example, but then come in and keep mm. you. And yeah, yeah, it is. And that's why I think you have to work with, uh, you have to be uh, diversified. You mm-hmm. need to work with uh, smart asset managers. Well, and diversified and, in your bank accounts. I can't yes. believe how many, I'm like, these. I, I've talked to funds that literally last, this is uh, when SVB went down. They sent out letter notices. We uh, We actually can't, as a fund, we can't make payroll on Friday because all of our money was at, at SVB. I was mm-hmm. like, really? You guys are asset managers. You diversify a portfolio, you have this whole thing, but you didn't diversify your bank, bank accounts? Account. You didn't diversify who, where your flows of money coming in now? Like what kind of money manager are you? You would think tr- a smart treasury manager yeah. would go through, and our, our company right here, we, we're pretty, uh, kind of a small, we have about 50 employees. We have three different, we have Chase, Wells Fargo, we have multiple accounts at both those banks and a Charles Schwab account just for that same reason. We don't yep. even use two of them really, but we have them just as backups. We had those, we did those last year because we wanted diversification across our portfolio. Same with us. And Matt actually sent out an email to all of the banks with follow-up calls mm. of any place that we had 250K or above balances yeah. that could possibly not have the FDIC insurance. Fortunately, we were in a good spot with that. But yep. recently I talked to a few of our investors who only had an account with SVB. And sadly, they found out about this before things were tanking mm. and they tried to send out a wire, but they didn't have another their bank account to wire it to. Oh, so by the time shoot. they set up another bank account, the money froze it's and it couldn't late. go out. And yeah. so uh, that is an interesting diversification strategy that you maybe don't think about that often. 
so many people, startups rely on SVB. Mm-hmm. They're one of the best in, in getting capital from them. But you never think I need to open up other accounts to then transfer some. So it's it's an interesting time right now. And yeah. we don't yet know all the repercussions, which is why I think it's still too early yeah. to see how all of this plays out. Um, I'm optimistic longer term, but yeah. I think in the short term, there may be st- still some pain points that mm. we see before it gets better. Interesting. There's an interesting book I read called The Finance Curse. And this book talks about um, in Africa, and it goes through Middle Eastern countries, where there was a, a very diversified workforce. You had students coming through the school system, they were going to be doctors and lawyers and teachers and other stuff. And actually, they said back in the 1960s, a banker and a teacher made about the same amount of salary in the United States. Then he goes, then they call this the finance curse is where banking or finance makes a lot of money. And so kids that were maybe going to go to NASA and be a astrophysicist go, well, I could do that. Or I could just go into banking and take my statistical analysis there and I'll make three to four million a year doing that rather than 200,000 doing this. And what happens is it sucks the best and brightest of a full generation into the world of finance. And it's, it, was, it went through all these countries in Africa and the Middle East that have had essentially this huge surplus of kids that are smart, great kids going just all into one industry. Wow. And an industry that kind of has innovation, but not really, you know? where they could have spent that working on rockets or new technologies or whatever, but they wake, make way more money in this finance curse. I thought it was a very interesting read and something that's happening right now, especially with when you continue to bail out a banking industry um, and they still offer really high salaries and huge bonuses that a, a really smart kid from MIT that's gonna go change the world, a uh, hedge fund shows up and said, hey, we'll pay you four million a year, come make statistical analysis for us, charts and stuff do you want like in or out? And like that kid's going to go, well, yeah, I'm in, you know, fascinating. It's a very unless interesting the, book. Unless they're following their passion, which yeah. is hard to do when you're giving up that much. Upside. And you're in student, student loans and debt and yeah. all this stuff. And you're like, well, I might as well. You very know what true. I mean? Yeah. It's pretty wow. interesting. That, what's that book called again? The finance curse. Really cool. It's an interesting read. It really changed my perspective on the world of finance. Yeah. Uh, it was very interesting. One, one thing, Bridger, I know we need to wrap up here or something, but tax incentive does impact that greatly. Mm. You, you know, R&D credits, right? And so there are opportunities through it that allow someone to have an artificially higher salary than they would have otherwise oh, interesting. because the yeah, industry that. doesn't create enough value yet. But mm. you got to stay on the forefront on technology and developing as a country. Mm. So meaning if you had a $250,000 salary, you don't have to pay as high taxes on that salary? Well, you no, an R&D credit or how does that work? There's typically uh, ways for wise? tax dollars to be able to be invested in a particular industry oh, gotcha. okay, so that so someone yes. could get yeah. an artificially higher salary than what the actual field would provide. And mm, that does help yeah. keep those types of jobs, I guess, competitive. Although this disparity is not going to be one that would make sense, I guess. But I, I do think that that's where I find it so interesting. The tax code specifically creates jobs, mm. but it also creates uh, money that flows into certain industries mm. based on the needs that America has. And so um, it's just interesting to follow where the money yeah. goes. Well, I think and- it's a good point you bring up is the tax code is all about incentive based. I believe, uh, it was, I can't remember the first, you might know the story of the first time they did a tax incentive. Do you know that story? Uh, I, that? No, Tom Wilwright talks about 2% of the tax code, why you have to pay taxes. 98% is why you don't have to pay taxes mm, yeah. of that 2%. And so all your time should be spent on why you shouldn't have to pay tax based on all the incentives that yep. are available to you. But, yes, it was a story, I can't, I'll mess up the details, but early 1900s, they tested out a tax incentive. And they thought, well, maybe people would do it, maybe not. We'll just see. And all of a sudden, this huge amount of capital flowed in this one area. And they're like, huh. And they said, let's try it again. Because they needed, uh, there was one for um, like an energy deal. They needed energy investment on something. And and like huge amount of capital flowed into it. And they thought, huh, let's do it again. Then they moved in. If you have multiple kids or if you have a bigger family, we need more, you know, child uh, childbirth. Yeah. And they had, they gave, and all of a sudden, all these kids were born. And like they, they, then they slowly started adding these things to the tax code over time. So people that might sit here and say, oh man, you're a tax evader. Yeah, there are illegal ways for yeah. sure to evade taxes, but there's also many legal ways that are built into the code to incentivize you to invest into oil and gas or truck stops, or to incentivize you to invest into real estate or into uh, to move your capital in a certain direction. And you need smart people like Jason Harris to walk you through that and understand the tax code very well. And that's, uh, it's it's built in. It's actually what they want from the tax code. It's 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 absolutely correct. Because if you give an incentive out, there's actually a stronger multiple of return to the government Mm. than if they try to pay taxes and then create jobs of their own. A government job 
is a sixty thousand dollar a year job that's raised by taxes. Mm -hmm. So they have to raise taxes to then pay the sixty thousand dollars a year. Eighteen percent of jobs in America are government ran jobs. Mm -hmm. So that's all of our tax money that we're paying in to support 18% of the jobs in the job market. Mm, yeah. Or you can give tax incentives to business owners. And business owners will then create jobs. Mm. They'll cover all the expenses to pay them. And the incentive itself is a one in nine multiple in some of the studies that I've read. And so one, one in nine. One multiple. in nine. Really? And so Jeez. you either pay them directly from tax dollars, or you create incentives for people like us to hire employees, yep. and then we'll take on the risk, we'll take on it, uh, the, the uh, I, I guess the wages that would be paid yep. out, yep. and in return, yes, we get some nice incentives, but it's a better return for the government to do it that way. And we're gonna do it in a more efficient way with than less the government, risk. with way less risk from the government yep. side, because that's capitalism. That's, that's why right. I love capitalism that's so right. much. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, I mean, you saw, for example, I'd love to talk through opportunity zones. That was a huge incentive that uh, more money was invested into ghetto, rural, inner city areas in two years with opportunity zones than the past 50 years with government programs and Bigger Brother and charity. What Trump did was say, hey, if you guys invest into opportunity zones, you get a huge tax benefit. If you if you develop those properties, you have to increase the value over 50% and hold them, I, you'll probably know the- 10 years. Is yep. it 10 years is the total time? Yep. You'll pay $0 in taxes. It's phenomenal. And I believe it was 100 billion that went into that, correct? I, I don't know the numbers, but it was a, a huge amount of money. And it and it, everyone wins. It was a yep. phenomenal tax opportunity. The investor wins. Yeah. The inner city areas win because they get more improved buildings and better areas. The people that they're live around there, the value of their real estate increases now. Safety, crime so, goes down. Crime goes down and safety. The kids that live there, families that live there have a better family and there's less, you know, gang violence and stuff. It was an incredible thing that happened in two years. More progress happened in those two years than you would say decades before. And I believe it was a hundred million that went in initially without like 250 billion peg to go in over the next five years or something like that. But very, very interesting yeah. with opportunities on funds. I'm hoping that they are renewed at some point. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yep. We'll see if they keep that going. I yep. know that was, a, that was a really cool thing. All right, a couple last questions for you. We'll get awesome. you out of here. Um, uh, what's a book that has changed or impacted your life immensely? Um, the one I was just mentioning, Tom Wilright, mm. Tax-Free Wealth. He was the CPA for Robert Kiyosaki. I've read this book. But yes. uh, he actually has come out with a second edition mm. and actually has things that are very current for 2022, 2023. And he has a new book, and that's where I got this recent study about how the incentives, 18% uh, of government jobs. So I can't mm. remember the name of it. That that one was audible, so I don't really remember the, the page of it. But that book absolutely opened my eyes to how beneficial the tax incentives are and why it's good for the government. It's better for the government to do it that way mm. than to just charge us, charge more in taxes. Mm. Um, and uh, it helped me understand how to use real estate as a massive tax shelter strategy when done correctly. And it's helped me grow my wealth far faster than I thought I, I could and helped us grow our investor base's wealth in, in the same. And so love that book. So many great golden nuggets there for people who are paying a large tax bill each year. Yeah, so. really cool, I love it. Yeah. Um, okay, two last questions. Uh, what's a great way for people to maybe follow you or connect you or find your group online if they wanna learn more, what's a great way to find you guys? Harrisinvestmentgroup.com, our website there. Um, uh, Instagram, I guess you could find us, Harris Investment Group. Um, Jesse Yates is usually the head person that we have. Bronson would be just fine too, but mm -hmm. uh, I would just go to harrisinvestmentgroup.com. Okay, harrisinvestmentgroup.com. It's yeah. awesome. Thank you so much for coming on today. Final question. Yeah. Um, if you could leave this audience with one thing that was most valuable to you, something that you thought would just change your life or change someone else's life that's listening, you can talk religion, politics, business, finance, tax savings. What do you think would be the most valuable thing you'd leave with this group uh, before we close up? Best investment that you can ever make is in yourself. Um, you've got to set aside time every day if possible to invest in your your knowledge your relationships spirituality physical uh, goals and i think i i love investing i love mm. the financial successes i've seen but the best investment i've ever made is just uh, investing myself and finding out for me what gives me true joy true satisfaction mm. and yeah. making time for that you know every day and um i think that's the thing that i feel like provides me the most joy in life is uh, when you're able to set the distractions aside and really listen to your you know, inner being, you'll find the answers of what's going to bring you happiness in this life. And we don't, I mean, we love making money for our investors and making money ourselves, but at the end of the day, it's, it's more for 
the relationships that we can make in this life and the uh, opportunities and activities that we can do with the money. But it's all going to stay here. I hope to give yeah. some away to charities and good for good purposes. So I just say, make sure you're investing in yourself and your health and the relationships. That's what's going to bring you the most fulfillment. Mm, I love that. Spot on. Jason yeah. Harris, everybody go follow him online at harrisinvestmentgroup.com. Go check him out. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks, Bridger. Yeah. Appreciate it.